appreciate everybody's effort to come. Uh, my name is John Eckenrode, for those of you I haven't met. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, our guest today. So welcome to the annual John Doris Memorial Lecture. Um, I want to recognize a few people today. Um, Ellen Doris is here, one of John's uh, John scholars. He would just stand up and say, wave or something. <laughs> I want to thank Patty Thayer, who's in the back. We did all of uh, <laughs> And I just want to remind you that after the presentation today, we will have lunch in the back. It will come. The table will be filled. So feel free to uh, stay around after the talk and have lunch, um, meet with our guests, uh, and just uh, catch up with each other. That would be great to have you stay around. Uh, now this lecture, as the name implies, is, is named after John Doris, who was the founder and long-standing uh, director of the Family Life Development Center, which was one of the two parent centers of the Bronfen Brenner Center for Translational Research, which was formed by the merger of the FLDC with the Bronfen Brenner Life Course Center in 2011. Uh, and we're very pleased to uh, keep the legacy of John Doris alive through many of our programs, but also through this uh, annual lecture. Now John's why I was in, in the back of your program, and I, I, for those of you who didn't know John, uh, please take a moment to, to read that over. But he was trained as a clinical, uh, child clinical psychologist at Yale, and he worked as chief psychologist at the Yale Child Study Center, while also an assistant professor at Yale's uh, Department of Psychology. That was before he joined the Cornell faculty in 1963. Um, as a faculty member and director of the Family Life Development Center, uh, uh, Dr. Doris helped build uh, the infrastructure really for, for many of the programs that we still are running in the BCPR today. So he helped build effective training and research programs in close collaboration with state, ag state agencies, particularly with OCFS, Office of Children and Family Services, uh, particularly around at that time issues of child abuse and neglect and family violence. But we during his tenure and afterwards, we, we developed it in many different ways around children and family issues. Uh, so I think he'd be very pleased uh, with today's speaker and today's topic. It was uh, I'm sure one that he'd be very interested in. As a center, the Bronfen Center Center promotes uh, the use of science-based evidence in the design of programs and interventions to benefit family and children. Uh, several of the BCTR programs involve adolescents and adolescent development, so we're very pleased uh, to have our guest with us today to talk about adolescents. I think we can all relate to that, either having been adolescents uh, or having been parents of adolescents uh, or serving adolescents in our programs uh, locally and, and, and statewide. So I think it's a topic that's sort of near and dear to all of our hearts. So let me just take a few moments uh, and not do full justice by any means uh, to tell you a little bit about our speaker today, uh, Dr. Judith Santana. Uh, Judy is a professor of psychology and director of the developmental psychology PhD program at the University of Rochester. And she was the past Frederica Warner chair there as well. And she graduated uh, with a BA from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, received her MS and PhD in psychology from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She just told me she actually started in HDFS here at Cornell. Um, among other things, uh, I thought I want to spend five years or so in the winters, it, and uh, being back in Santa Cruz actually might be a better idea. <laughs> uh, so she went back to Santa Cruz, got a degree there, uh, but then found her way back upstate New York anyway. Um, so, um, and she also completed a postdoc a fellowship at the University of Michigan. Uh, her work focuses on three areas, which she'll really talk about one of those in particular today. One is on adolescent parent relationships and adolescent development in general and in different uh, cultural contexts. And she's conducting several uh, studies I'm sure she'll talk about today uh, in her talk. But she also does a lot of work over the years and is, is well known for her work on young children's moral and social uh, development, social knowledge, including the development and conceptual distinction distinctions between children's understanding of moral and social conventional rules and transgressions, relationships among social knowledge, affect, and behavior, and 
contextual influences on social and moral judgments. So she has a whole other part of her research program she might touch on today, but that's, that's maybe the stuff of another talk. She also does a lot of work on parents' parenting beliefs and their relationship to parenting practices and child outcomes. So she has a busy lab with lots of students, and she does, she's well known in these various areas. These, of course, are highly important issues for the field, but also for our work in the center. Uh, she's published many articles and chapters on these topics. She's authored several books, including Adolescents, Families, and Social Development, How Children Structure Social Worlds, and has had several edited volumes, including The Handbook of Moral Development, uh, and, and among others. She's a prolific researcher and author. Her research has been supported by many federal and foundation grants, as well as, as well. And she has served on many national boards and committees devoted <coughs> to the well-being of children and adolescents. And let me just point out actually a local example that came up recently. Judy served as the chair of the Individual Awards Committee for the Society for Research on Adolescent Meetings that just took place in Baltimore a few weeks ago. And she was the uh, one handing the award to one of our former students, Dayanira Exner Cortez, who some of you know, who worked in, as a graduate student in human development. Uh, I was the chair of her committee, and she worked in the center on several different projects. And she got this year's dissertation award from the Society for Research on Adolescence. And we have a nice picture we put up on our website of, of Judy and Daniela and the president of SRA uh, giving her this nice award. So we have a local connection to your service work as well in the field. So thank you for that. Uh, needless to say, we're very pleased to have uh, Judy with us today and taking some time out of her busy schedule. And uh, so I would now just ask you to uh, please join me in welcoming her to Cornell and to the Boston Medicine. Thank you, John, for that really nice introduction. It's, um, I'm delighted to be here today in what could have been my alma mater, but turned out not to be. <laughs> That's a story for another day. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, one thread of my research program, a very active part of my um, program, something I've been engaged in for 30 or 35 years now, but who's counting? Um, so I've been looking at adolescent parent relationships in different cultural contexts and ethnic contexts. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide an overview of some of the findings from the program of research. I'm actually going to start from some of my early research. Um, and then I'm going to focus on some of the issues that are um, occupying me now. So I want to start, um, John alluded to sort of the, the um, way we think about adolescence that we all have experience with it. Um, I want to kind of briefly talk about the way we think about adolescence, at least in our cultural context. Um, there's this very pervasive view of adolescence as being a period of storm and stress, um, a very difficult period um, for both adolescents and their parents. Um, we tend to talk about adolescence as a period entailing a generation gap between adolescents and parents, um, and a time when adolescents rebel against adult standards and parental authority. And you know, this is not a new view. You can go back to the ancient Greeks and you, you read the same kinds of things. So um, part of my interest in, in this is sort of what's going on here and why, you know, why do we have these views of adolescent parent relationships. So one way that you can, um, that the popular view is really evident is if you go to your local bookstore, um, you go to the parenting advice sections and you look at the books um, about parenting. So typically they're organized chronologically. If you look at the, ba the books on infancy, you see happy, smiling, beaming babies, happy parents. Everything looks terrific. Um, you move to the section of books on middle childhood. There things seem to get a little bit more serious, but they're still generally positive books on how to instill character in, your, uh, in, your, uh, in middle childhood and so on. And then we get to the books on adolescent parent relationships. And this is what you see. <laughs> so surviving your adolescence, how to manage and let go of your 13 to 18 year old. <laughs> Teenagers, a bewildered parent's guide. And this is one of my favorites. Um, get out of my life, but first could you drive me and Cheryl to the mall? So, I mean, the picture is generally um, not quite so positive for parents or for teenagers. 
And um, here's a recent addition to the canon, which I find amusing. We've now learned that surviving your dog's adolescence is difficult. So it's not just humans, it's sort of a general phenomenon of difficulty during adolescence. So um, if we turn to the research views, uh, we actually find a, um, in some cases, a somewhat um, similar view. So some of the research does show that parent parenting teenagers is difficult and stressful. Um, some people argue that it's the most stressful period of the life of a parent um, beyond infancy. Um, research, this meta-analysis is now quite old, but generally it shows that conflict between adolescents and parents um, increases during adolescence, that in particular the frequency of conflict increases, uh, sorry, um, increases in early adolescence and then declines, um, and that the intensity of conflicts or disagreements between parents and adolescents increases from early to mid-adolescence. And um, we also know, um, and this is with research on um, youth from a variety of different cultural and ethnic contexts, that closeness between parents and adolescents generally declines with age, um, and the differences in terms of race and ethnicity and culture is that in some places the decline occurs later, but it's generally fairly universal that this happens. Um, but we also know that our people have hypothesized, and, and some support shows, that mild conflict in the context of supportive parent-child relationships is actually fairly useful for the development of autonomy. So um, in my talk today, um, I want to talk about this program of research that I've been engaged in. Um, I've been particularly interested in social cognitive aspects of adolescent parent relationships. Um, that is how adolescents and parents think about their relationships and then of course the relationship between their thinking and their actual behavior. Um, so I'm going to talk about several different um, topics that, have, that I've spent time researching. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about research on adolescent parent conflict um, in diverse cultural and ethnic contexts, which is where I began um, in terms of the, the um, progress of my research. Um, I'm then going to talk about beliefs about uh, parental authority or authority legitimacy and how those change across, um, across the adolescent period. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about links between parental authority and parental monitoring. Um, and then I'm going to end up with the research that I'm doing now, which is on disclosure and secrecy in adolescent parent relationships. And one thing that has um, pervaded all of this research um, is that I am interested in diverse contexts. So I've looked at adolescent parent relationships um, in different cultures <coughs> and in different ethnic and racial contexts. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and I'm also interested um, when people study culture, they often focus primarily on difference. Um, I've been interested both in universality in adolescent parent relationships, and I want to argue that there are some persistent issues or themes that do carry across different cultural contexts, but also that there are context-specific aspects of adolescent parent relationships. So that's kind of a lot to uh, accomplish in the next hour. I hope I'll um, be able to get through this. So I'm going to start with the research I began many, many years ago on adolescent parent conflict. Um, it actually came directly out of my teaching adolescent development and um, teaching about the kinds of the issues that I began the talk with, a sort of view of adolescence as difficult and involving a generation gap between um, adolescents and children. And I, I actually have to mention, since I'm at Cornell, um, some of you may remember John Hill, um, who was a colleague and an inspiration for me in this research. He passed away many years ago, but he was a major contributor to um, this area of research. So I began a series of studies um, of adolescents and parents um, to look at how they, I was interested in how they think about issues of conflict. Um, because people were saying there's this, you know, turmoil, rebellion, and so on. So just very briefly, um, I'm not going to spend time on a lot of method stuff or too much sample description, but the studies I'm going to talk about in this very first part of my talk come from 
three distinct groups. They were studied independently. I'm going to show data together, but they were not comparative studies. So like many researchers um, doing research in the mid-80s, um, I was not paying attention initially to context. Um, and so I began my research on adolescence by studying middle class, primarily white um, suburban families in cross-sectional research. Um, along with the times, you know, I sort of became much more clued into thinking much more about cultural and ethnic variation. So I'm going to compare some of those findings with um, Chinese teens in Hong Kong and China. Um, I have a collaborator who's lived in China, so we were able to do this research together. And then finally, a uh, longitudinal study over five years of uh, middle uh, socioeconomic status black or African American families. Um, so these families were fo followed for five years. So as I said, um, I'm, I became interested primarily in how adolescents and parents think about issues of conflict. There had been a lot of research looking at things like um, how much conflict occurs, the frequency of conflict, the intensity of conflict, how angry it is, and so on. But I wanted to, to you know, in their own words, look at how adolescents and parents thought about it. So here's an example um, from, um, so we interviewed, we brought families into the lab, we interviewed, we asked them to generate issues of conflict in their family, we asked them then to talk about their perspective and the other person's perspective. So this is a fairly prototypical example of, of a mom's reasoning. Um, why do you think she should clean up her room? Those of you who've been parents may resonate to the room as being, uh, it's a really big issue of conflict. Um, well, her room is part of the house and it's her responsibility to keep it clean. We all live here. We all have to do our part. I'm not asking for much, just for her to straighten up a bit. Why is that important? Well, I'd be really embarrassed to have anyone see her room looking like that. And then um, another mom, why do you think he should help around the house? Because then the house won't stay a big mess because he knows how to pick up his stuff. Just like I pick up my stuff, he needs to know we don't have maids and butlers around here. So what's going on? You know, how, how do we interpret these findings? Uh, in my research, I've looked at how um, adolescents and parents think about conflict and other issues in terms of a theoretical perspective called social domain theory um, that makes distinctions among different forms of social knowledge. And as John said, much of my research focuses, or another part of my research, focuses on distinctions between morality and social conventions. Um, we think about morality as concepts of welfare, justice, and rights, and social conventions as um, the kinds of norms that are relative to particular social contexts, but help uh, provide information about how to behave. So uh, morality really are, is not much of the story here in terms of thinking about adolescent parent conflict, but it's part of the, the theoretical framework on which I'm drawing. So um, if you think about the examples that I gave you, um, what I want to point out is that mom's reasoning in those two examples was primarily what I would call social conventional in nature. Um, so basically they're talking about um, social, the need for social order, for authority, for uh, respect and so on. Um, another issue that, that becomes important are prudential issues. It's a distinction that's made in this research. Um, so prudential issues pertain to the individual's comfort or safety or health. Okay, so what does this look like when we look across these different kinds of samples in terms of the ways that um, parents think about issues of conflict? These are data from um, Hong Kong, from white uh, parents and black parents. Um, as I said, the studies aren't comparative, but I want to give you sort of a visual of what the findings look like. And um, what's particularly important here is to note that conflicts are primarily conventional. Um, there are some differences among the ethnic groups. Um, I won't go into why those occur, uh, but if we have time for questions, you can ask me. Um, but the important point here is that conf conflicts, at least from parents' perspectives, are primarily about um, violations of social conventions. So parents may talk about contrasting uh, norms and standards, 
or um, responsibility as a member of the family to do their part, um, the need for social coordination to divide the labor, um, social costs like embarrassment of not um, uh, behaving according to social norms and so on. So all of those are conventional reasons. And then, um, and these constituted over about 50% of parents' ways of thinking about conflict. Um, and then you also see that prudential and pragmatic reasons, so safety, comfort, and health were really important for parents. Okay, so do teens think about conflicts in these ways? So you might think back to your own adolescence when you disagreed with your parents. Um, were these the kinds of things you were worried about? Um, probably not, at least that's what our data would show. So here's some examples from um, teens reasoning uh, on similar issues. Um, teens are saying, it's my room, it's nobody else's business, what it looks like, what it should look like. Why do you think your mom thinks you should clean it? Because she says the room is part of the house and she thinks it should look nice. Um, what do you think of that? It's not like there's anything gross in there. If my mom doesn't like it, she can just close the door. Um, and then the second response, um, what is it that you want to do? Just go to bed. I just don't want to do it sometimes. Why do you think it's okay for you not to do it? Because no one else is going to be in my room. This is my room. I want it to look like I want it to look like. Um, what does your mom want? She wants me to get off my butt and clean the room and be done with it. Okay, so how do we interpret these responses? Um, again, I've turned to social domain theory as a framework for understanding these responses. And what I've argued is that these kinds of responses are all examples of personal issues, which in a more broader theoretically, theoretical framework are part of um, adolescence or individual psychological knowledge. So we've defined personal issues as issues that pertain to privacy, to control over one's body, and to one's preference and choices, particularly over things like um, leisure activities, uh, recreational activities, and friends. Um, and part of what's important about personal issues are these are issues that individuals believe are outside of moral and conventional or societal regulation um, because the acts pertain only to the self. They're up to you. They shouldn't be anyone else's business. No one else has a right to, to um, make these kinds of rules. And our argument has been that the breadth of the, and content of the personal domain may vary cross-culturally. So in some cultures, um, the personal domain may be broader than in others. I would argue in the US, um, we have sort of a broad notion of what's personal and up to the individual. In other cultures, it may be narrow, or other ethnic groups as well. Um, but individuals in all cultures claim a personal domain. Um, and that's in part because it satisfies universal needs, particularly for agency, for autonomy, and effectiveness. And I should point out <coughs> that the examples that I gave you, um, both of teens and parents, are from different ethnicity and different youth, Chinese, African American, if we had a lot more time, or this were an undergraduate lecture, I'd ask you to try to identify who's saying what. Um, but the point is that they sound very much the same. Um, so Chinese youth end up uh, in Hong Kong, um, sound pretty much like American teens in the US when talking about why things should be up to them to decide. So if we look at the coding of adolescence justification responses, um, again, what you see is that um, that there are particular types, types of reasons that adol adolescents use, um, and that across all three cultural contexts, um, both Chinese adolescents in Hong Kong and U.S. adolescents, both middle class Ameri uh, uh, European American and um, African American, that the primary way of thinking about conflicts is in terms of personal reasoning. It's up to me, it's, not, it's private, it's not parents' business. Um, and, you know, I want to point out this is also interest, interesting because, um, you know, we talk about certain kinds of cultural groups like Chinese families as stressing um, family obligations, the importance of duty and respect, and yet here are adolescents appealing to the personal domain saying it should be up to me. So while those values are important, 
um, other values are important as well. So why do we get these really different views between adolescents and parents? Um, what I've argued on is that parents are doing what parents ought to do. Um, that is, um, they're trying to socialize their adolescents, they're preparing them for effective participation in society, that's sort of the conventional aspect. Um, what they're trying to do is teach cultural norms, but also family and community norms. So the, the stress on, on social conventions, sometimes about family social conventions, this is the way we do it in our house, um, sometimes it's about community social conventions or cultural ones. Um, but adolescents, in contrast, um, it's not that they don't think that those things are important, but in these particular areas of, it, of disagreement, um, they're focusing on gaining grading, uh, greater autonomy, um, individuating from parents, and gaining control over the self and, per, and activities. And so these kinds of these reasons, these, di these different perspectives on conflict reflect an ongoing dialectic um, that leads to the transformations of parental authority. So adolescents continually are claiming more uh, personal choice over their activities. And um, in my view, at least, some of this works from the bottom up in order to lead parents to reevaluate their limits, sort of change the boundaries of um, what's personal for the teen. So I want to sort of depict this graphically. Um, basically, we've done a lot of research on adolescents and parents' conceptions of legitimate parental authority, looking at different kinds of issues and looking at where adolescents and parents believe that the boundary between uh, parental authority legitimacy and adolescent personal jurisdiction over the self should be drawn. And one of the interesting findings of this is that um, adolescents do believe that parents have a considerable amount of, of authority. They are seen as legitimate authorities over a wide variety of issues. So um, adolescents throughout, from early adolescence to late adolescence, believe that parents do have authority to regulate moral issues, which I've de defined previously. They have legitimate authority over conventional issues, which I've also defined, and prudential issues. Um, and uh, both adolescents and parents, to some extent, believe that there is a zone, a realm of issues that should be up to adolescents um, to decide. It's just how much and over what is a source of some disagreement. So in some of our research, we've looked at judgments of parental authority legitimacy, and I want to give you a sense of those data. Um, so this is from our five-year longitudinal study of African-American families. And um, uh, I can see that the lines are a little bit difficult to see. Um, but these are their judgments of authority legitimacy over moral and conventional issues. So the things I want to point out are, first of all, um, that um, with 100 being, you know, parents have all the legitimate authority, that both parents and teens are way up there. They, uh, you know, they, they believe that parents have legitimate authority, and that doesn't change over time. So um, we ran multi-level models of change using structural equation modeling here, and what we find is that there are no declines over time in either adolescents or parents, um, judgments of legitimate parental authority, and, um, but there are some significant differences, even within these very high ratings, with parents see themselves as having somewhat more authority than, than kids do. So when is parental authority rejected? Well, I've sort of given you that answer already. Um, it's when acts are seen as personal. Um, so kids reject parents as having legitimate authority to regulate acts that they believe ought to be within their personal domain, as we saw in the instances of adolescent parent conflict. Um, and essentially what our research shows is that the personal domain expands during adolescence. Um, I think conflict is one of the mechanisms that leads to changes in the boundaries of the personal domain. Um, and teens always claim, or tend to claim, more control over personal issues than parents are willing to grant. 
So again, here are data from our five-year longitudinal study of African-American families. And um, um, the, the uh, blue lines are parent ratings. The pink lines are adolescence ratings. Um, and what you see is that um, there's a set of issues. That the two dotted lines are parents, adolescents and parents. Um, let's see, is that right? Yes. Uh, the dotted lines are comparisons of parents or moms and teens' ratings of personal issues. There actually is a significant decline in moms' ratings, so they're giving kids more authority over the five years of the study. Um, but they're much higher in terms of how much authority they believe they have than teens have. Um, whereas there's this, um, these issues that we refer to as multifaceted, these are the boundary issues that tend to cause conflict between adolescents and parents. This is the zone where the personal domain uh, expands. Um, there are significant declines between both, for both uh, moms and adolescents over time in how much legitimate authority um, parents ought to have over those issues. Although, as you can see from the, the two straight lines, um, Teens believe that they have much, that they personally have much more authority than moms do. So I'm doing this kind of quickly. Does all that make sense to you? Before I, okay. Okay. So to go back to this um, um, uh, figure uh, of uh, parental authority legitimacy, what I'm arguing is that there's this zone between legitimate parental authority and issues that are seen as legitimately under teen control, which is the areas or boundaries over which that, that adolescents and parents negotiate over for greater autonomy. So we call these multifaceted issues um, because they tend to involve different interpretations about the fundamental nature of the issue, with adolescents claiming them as personal um, and parents saying these are conventional or prudential. So um, essentially, they, these are issues that become redefined as personal through negotiation and conflict. Oop. So what happens is that through negotiation, discussion, and so on, the personal domain e expands. But there's always a new set of issues that adolescents and parents are renegotiating. So for instance, in middle adolescence, when romantic relationships become important, all of a sudden, that may become sort of a zone of negotiation. Once that's resolved, they may, may move on to another set of issues that need to be re renegotiated as up to the teen to decide. OK. Um, so I'm going to take a little aside um, to talk about some, just very briefly, some current research that I'm kind of excited about. Um, I've been doing this research on authority legitimacy for a number of years. Um, but we're currently doing this in a really interesting context, which is that um, I'm part of a, a study team that's looking at Arab refugee youth in the Middle East. So um, I'm going to just show you a little bit of those data because it's so interesting and so complex. So we know that normatively the personal domain expands with age and that adolescents get more autonomy over personal issues. Um, but we also know from other research, um, so um, there's, there are a number of researchers who have been very focused on individual differences within this normative uh, pattern. So uh, Bobby Laird at Louisiana, Nancy Darling, who used to be a faculty member here, uh, Patricio Cumcia in, Ch in Chile. Um, and essentially, they've looked at individual differences in, in legitimacy beliefs. And essentially what they find is that within this normative pattern, that stronger legitimacy beliefs and greater obligations to obey parents, um, especially in early adolescence, are associated with better adjustment and more compliance with parental rules. So more compliance, less norm-breaking, uh, norm but it is moderated by domain. So um, there are still parents have much less authority over personal issues, but even within that, um, sort of kids who are higher in um, authority beliefs tend to be look like they're doing better. So um, 
In this current study that we're doing with refugee youth, um, part of what we were interested in is whether Arab youth from, from different national backgrounds and with various kinds of experiences, so for instance, political conflict, um, displacement, uh, and so on, um, poverty, social class, have differentiated beliefs about parental authority legitimacy. So partly this, looking, this is looking at both the universality of the kinds of distinctions that I'm making, but also the contextual variables that may um, influence their beliefs. And um, so we've looked at that both in terms of normative, um, normative beliefs um, and also in terms of parenting profiles. Um, this next slide, um, I'm going to actually not spend time on because it's really complex. But what I want to point out is that um, we did confirmatory factor analyses. Uh, let me tell you, the sample is, consists of Iraqi, Palestinian, and uh, Syrian youth. All have been displaced um, to war, due to war or political conflict and are currently living in Jordan. The Palestinians are um, living in refugee camps. They've been there for generations. Um, and the Iraqis and Syrians have been displaced due to political conflict. Um, the Syrians are recent um, refugees. They vary enormously in terms of their life circumstances prior to displacement, their current socioeconomic status, um, and their current living conditions. Um, Palestinians are living in camps. Um, the Syrians that we studied in Amman, Jordan are not, even though many, many Syrians are in camps, um, and so on. Um, so they, the, by the national groups are really quite different, not comparable, um, sort of hard to you know, put together. But essentially what we found is that they do make the same kinds of distinctions among different kinds of social acts um, that we find in the U.S. with uh, the exception of a couple of interest, well, there are a couple of interesting exceptions. So friendship items are not treated in the same way as they are in the U.S. Um, actually for some refugee youth, um, what they do with friends is seen as moral, um, not conventional or prudential or personal and so on. So I'm not going to spend time on that right now. I was going to point out some paths, but I won't. Um, John wants me to leave a little time for questions, and I'm going to give you lots of stuff you could ask about. Um, this, I think, is really interesting, because this is a person-centered analysis. It's a, um, if you're into stat, it's a latent profile analysis. Um, this is a sample of about 1,000 teens. And um, essentially what we were interested in was what is this, you know, there, what are the different profiles that emerge among um, these different youth? And what I want to point out is that the variations among these different profiles are primarily about how they, and, and I know you can't read these, but let me just say these are moral issues. Um, that are culturally uh, appropriate. These are conventional issues. These are prudential issues. So we have some uh, appropriate conventional items, items like smoking hookah, um, illegal drug use, no alcohol, because that's a sin uh, in Arab culture. These are friendship items, and these are personal items. So what's interesting is that there's no variation among some very different profiles in how they treat personal issues. They believe that these are significantly different from the other issues in terms of being up, uh, up to teens to decide. And um, the person-centered analyses don't pu pull those apart at all. Essentially what uh, differentiates them is how they think about uh, friendship and prudential items. And um, essentially, 72% of the sample, and this is consistent with some other cross-cultural uh, research, treats um, all of the items in exactly the same way that they do in the U.S. with a lot of authority given to parents over moral and conventional and prudential items, less over friendship, which are sort of multifaceted or mixed, and less over personal items. So, and that doesn't vary. There's some slight variations by refugee group. Um, and some slight variations due to parental education. Um, but basically, that's sort of a normative pattern around which there are these other patterns. Um, the rebellious group is a small group. They're primarily Palestinians. They're more likely to be male. Um, these are kids who are 
getting into trouble, having, having adjustment difficulties. And you can see that um, these are the, this is the purple pattern. Um, part of what's interesting about them is they don't believe parents have authority over many of the risky prudential issues. And uh, there's some other correlates, but it's primarily Palestinian kids who are living in really fairly terrible uh, conditions. Okay. So, I've become interested in the last decade or so. Um, you know, we've been studying adolescent parent conflict and parental authority legitimacy. Um, but I've become interested, along with others in the field, about a more subversive side of adolescent development. Um, so what I've said was, and, and still believe, that conflict can be adaptive, uh, that is, mild conflict in the context of support, supportive parents can have adaptive functions in terms of helping to change um, the boundaries of parental authority toward greater adolescent autonomy. Um, but there are other ways that adolescents can seek autonomy rather than uh, disagreements with parents or simply discussion, which we're not capturing in these studies, but discussion and talking and you know, just, just um, negotiation with parents obviously is an optimal way of, uh, for adolescents to achieve more autonomy. But it also can be um, achieved in um, more devious ways. So conflict only occurs over issues that are brought uh, to parents' attention. So um, I was asked this morning about whether um, my research on conflict, whether there's a lot of um, conflict over sexual issues and adolescents having sex. And um, that was something that when we began the research, I was curious about too, because we never heard it come up as an issue of conflict. When we asked adolescents and parents, what are the issues that cause conflict? You don't hear about sex, you don't hear about drugs. I was gonna say sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You do hear about rock and roll. Um, so you don't hear about those things. Well, why not? These kids are doing these things. It's because um, they're hiding them. So um, we know, I'm gonna turn to the parent side of this first, and then I'm gonna turn to the teen side. So one of the things, one of the bedrocks of research on adolescents um, and um, advice on parenting is that if you wanna raise your kids so that they don't get into trouble, make sure you monitor them. Keep track of what they're doing, have, have rules for them, and ask them what they're doing. Um, and the assumption has been that parental monitoring is the source of parental knowledge, so it's good for parents to know what kids are doing. Then you can help guide them. Um, and that greater parental knowledge leads to reductions in deviant behavior. This has been uh, an assumption that's been taken for granted for 30 years. Um, which turns out not to be true. So that was a little spoiler. Um, but in some of my research, you know, this, people have assumed this. Um, they haven't really asked parents what they want to know. And um, people have looked at what parents really know. But in a, it's a, in a recent study, we actually decided to ask parents using the theoretical framework that I've been describing what they want to know about. Because obviously those are gonna be the things that they're gonna be motivated to find out about. Okay, so this is from a recent study. Um, it's a one year longitudinal study of adolescents and parents in Rochester, lower middle class, um, it's about 72% white, and uh, the rest is Asian and African American, or mixed. Um, and we asked about the kinds of issues we always ask in our research. So prudential issues, I have some examples. These are risky issues. Um, doing drugs, drinking alcohol, uh, multifaceted issues, these kind of boundary issues. We asked a lot about friendship issues. Um, romantic issues, if uh, we also talked earlier this morning about whether I was studying social media use, that a lot of social media use would fall into this multifaceted category, and then straightforward personal issues. So um, this probably isn't very surprising, um, but what parents really want to know about, it's a one to five scale, um, they really want to know about the prudential risky issues, um, they want to know quite a bit 
um, about multifaceted issues, and um, um, they want to know less about personal issues. They do want to know, but it's not as um, pressing. Um, we did latent growth curve analyses here to look at both um, whether there are changes over time um, in the slope and also to look at whether there's variance around either both the slope and the intercept. And um, actually, it doesn't look like prudential decline, but it actually all three declined over time. There's variation around the slopes and the intercepts. intercepts. So um, in our latent growth model here, we looked at what kinds of variables um, predict wanting to know about prudential issues. And it probably shouldn't come as a surprise that um, the kinds of variables that predict parents wanting to know about adolescents' risky behavior are ones that are associated with health, with good parenting, healthy adjustment. So parents who are um, less psychologically controlling and um, what else? Um, less psychologically controlling, start out wanting to know more, uh, negative interactions, they de when adolescents and parents have, when moms report having negative interactions, they decline more steeply, more, uh, more, um, they decline more, let me s say this correctly, um, decline more in ter over time in, term in terms of how much they want to know and so on. So clearly wanting to know about these things um, is really important if you're trying to guide your adolescent um, to healthy development. I'm not going to show you the latent growth model for personal issues, but there are far fewer correlates because it's sort of like, it's more, um, you're not as obligated to know about these things. So it's not necessarily, it doesn't really take good parenting necessarily uh, to predict wanting to know about these things. So. Um, what do parents actually know about this? Well, um, this is part of where it gets interesting. So if you look at um, moms and teens reports, um, this is only wave one because there's no change over time, uh, over the year of our study, in how much moms actually know. What you see is that, I want to point this out, that moms think they know the most about these risky behaviors, but they actually know the least according to teens reports. Um, and they actually think they know quite a bit about personal issues, and teens agree. There isn't as much, you know, there isn't as much at stake if you're having a good relationship with your parents and you want to talk about some of these issues. There's not as much at stake in revealing it, but there's a lot at stake if you, you know, tell your parents that you were at a party and uh, your mom didn't realize that there were boys there, you know, girls and there were boys there and people were drinking. Maybe a lot at stake in telling them. And moms are pretty much in the dark about this stuff. Okay, so as I said, um, the common knowledge is, you know, it's 10 o'clock, you should, you know, do you know where your children are? It's important to monitor. Um, and this, this slogan assumes the importance of parental monitoring and reducing um, deviant behavior. Um, and as a pair of researchers, uh, Karen Satin pointed out now 15 years ago, um, when people said that they were measuring parental monitoring, what their careful analysis showed was, in fact, the studies that say they're assessing parental monitoring are not, they're actually assessing parental knowledge. So essentially the variable had been mislabeled in most of the research. I actually am guilty of that in one of my early studies. So people who are saying I'm measuring monitoring, no, they aren't. They're, they're measuring how much parents actually know. Um, and what Karen Satine set out to do was to look at whether our belief about parental monitoring is correct, that it's a good thing, it leads to more parental knowledge, um, and helps keep, keep teens out of trouble. And the answer to that is no. Um, that parents actually, monitoring actually is not I as important, it's actually not correlated with uh, what parents know about adolescence activities. And what they've shown both cross-sectionally and longitudinally is that the most important predictor of how much parents know about what their teens are doing is how much adolescents are willing to disclose to them about it. <laughs> 
So parental knowledge comes from voluntary, willing disclosure, not from behavioral control, setting rules, um, or from actively asking kids, you know, what did you do at the party last night? In fact, what Karen and Satine have found is that the more parents solicit information, the worse things get for the relationship, and also seems to be reflective of kids who are in trouble. Um, the other thing we've learned from this research, um, which I think certainly gave me a pause as a parent, um, is that non-disclosure and secrecy, so non-disclosure is normative during adolescence, and it increases over the course of adolescence. So as kids get older, they are more likely to keep information from parents and actively uh, uh, keep secrets from them over the course of middle and late adolescence. So um, studying disclosure and secrecy in adolescent parent relationships has become sort of a hot topic of research. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about it in too much detail, um, but I want to show you a couple of findings. Um, one, this is from a study um, of multi-ethnic youth um, in LA. Um, we studied a large sample of um, Chinese American, Mexican American, and European American youth. Um, and like most of my research, we looked at the kinds of um, issues that they were disclosing or concealing. And I guess I'm going to ask you, I mean, what's your, what's your gut feeling about who's going to keep the most secrets? Any guesses? Anyone willing to put anything out there? I should ask you, Ellen. You're the <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> um, Okay, but what about ethnicity? That's absolutely <laughs> right. You're being cautious, and yes, you're right. Um, but would you, you know, in terms of ethnicity, do you have any guesses? Do you think that? <coughs> yeah. Chinese. Disclose the most. No. Oh, keep the keep the most secrets. Can I ask you why? Higher expectations are different. I won't say necessarily higher, but they're different and um, forbid certain behaviors that are in the adolescent mainstream. And I think the temptation to just don't tell your parents is greater. Great. Um, you know, interesting because when I usually ask this, people say um, that, well, do they say? Um, that white kids tell the most secrets, keep the most secrets, and in fact that's not the case. So the fact is that ethnic minorities tend to keep more secrets um, than um, um, white kids do. Um, they keep, this is disclosure to mothers, and um, am I saying this right? Um, they disclose, first of all, there, there are, varies by the type of issue, so they disclose more about personal issues, again, less at stake than they do about these kind of uh, domain boundary issues, these overlapping issues, um, and least about these prudential issues over which, you know, we've just learned this is what parents really want to know, that's what they tell the parents the least. And we also found that the more involved they are in risky behavior, the less likely they are to disclose to parents about these issues. And um, despite the fact that um, in our two groups of ethnic minority youth, there are lots of um, cultural values about family obligation and the need to family harmony, family obligation, to talk to your parents, these are the kids who disclose the least um, about prudential issues. And um, um, actually white kids do disclose more than, than Chinese. Part of what's interesting about this is that they have very different reasons for disclosing different kinds of issues. And um, this is across ethnic groups. It's a fi these are findings that we found in many studies. But the point is, it's a lot of data to look at. Um, why don't kids talk about prudential issues? Um, they, teens say, first of all, if you think back to authority legitimacy, they say parents do have the right 
um, to make rules about these kinds of issues. If you ask about obligations to obey, adolescents do say they're obligated to do what their parents want. If you ask about parents' right to know um, about different kinds of issues, they say that parents have a right to know about prudential issues, but they still don't disclose. And the reason they don't is because they want to um, avoid punishment, don't want to get in trouble. Um, for what we consider to be these mixed boundary issues, you find a mixture of concerns about getting in trouble, um, but also belief that the issues are private. So it reflects this sort of overlapping nature of these issues that kids are kind of split between saying, I don't want to tell them because um, you know, I'm going to get in trouble for doing so, and, and them also saying these, what I'm doing isn't harmful, it should be up to me, it's not their business. And then for personal issues, you know, you see overwhelming personal, uh, personal justifications as reasons for not disclosing um, that the acts aren't harmful, that it's private, it's not the parent's um, business. And then there were some really um, interesting cultural differences. So um, we found that Chinese children, adolescents in particular, um, argued that the reason not to, a reason that the reason that that the reason for not talking about personal issues, they were more likely than other groups to say that parents wouldn't listen or understand. Okay, well I have a, a lot more that I could say about disclosure and not disclosure and non-disclosure. Um, in particular, um, we've been looking at the kinds of strategies adolescents use to conceal information from parents. Um, secrecy is not of all of one type. There's different forms of non-disclosure, which range from giving your parents some information but not telling them all the important details, um, down sort of to the worst, which is lying. And so it turns out that the kinds of reasons that adolescents um, or the kinds of strategies that adolescents use to conceal information is very important in terms of the quality of family relationships um, and adjustment. That, but that's going to be a talk for another day. So just briefly, this is what we're doing right now. Um, the research on parental monitoring and the research on disclosure strategies has to some extent proceeded along separate lines. And in current analyses of our longitudinal data, what we're doing is conducting person-centered analyses, looking at family profiles of um, parent strategies for finding out versus kids' strategies for keeping things secret. So we're trying to look at whether you know, there's a match or there's certain profiles that are matches and mismatches between what parents are doing and what kids are doing. And um, there's some really interesting findings coming out of that. Um, the other thing we're doing with disclosure and concealment is that um, we're using narrative research to try to better understand what teens are making of these experiences. So I told you earlier that um, the research so shows that secrecy and non-disclosure increases over the course of adolescence and, and that kids tell their parents considerably less. It's not just about personal issues, it's not only for privacy, but also maybe about risky behavior. And so part of what we're interested in is what are kids learning from these experiences? Um, how do they remember, talk about them, and draw inferences about themselves and others from these experiences. And so we recently completed a study where we obtained narratives and follow-up questions from middle high school and college students where we asked them to provide separate narratives of a time when they wanted to do something their parents didn't want them to do, and um, they disclosed anyway um, they concealed or they lied. And um, our current analyses, we're, we're analyzing the narratives at multiple levels. Some of it is just straight linguistic analyses, like where do they, you know, um, uh, do they provide longer narratives or more, more to say about certain kinds of narratives than others? How does that change with age? Um, but we're also looking at the psychological content of the different narratives and the follow-up questions and um, the kind of life lessons they're getting from their experiences. Because it is really, I mean, sometimes you ask kids about lying, what did you learn about yourself? And they say, I learned I'm a really good liar. Um, and sometimes they say, you know, I learned I could have trusted my parents. So we're trying to look at the different meanings that they draw from those experiences um, and relate them to indices of adjustment. So I 
think I'm going to stop there. And I want to thank you and, um, for your attention. And I want to thank the many, many graduate students, too many to list, but there's some of them, um, and to the many sources of funding that I've received um, over the years. And this is my recent book. Well, thank you. You know, I threw a lot at you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How well do you find those parent beliefs about legitimacy translate to their behavior? Or, I don't know if you look at that, but how well is that uh, connected? You mean in terms of their parenting behavior? Yes. Um, actually, there's a, there's, I mean, I've been particularly interested in how parents, um, I mean, my belief is that you know, parents need to parent in certain ways. They need to, I mean, it's important to, to have authority over certain kinds of issues, maybe not, I mean, to be able to help regulate kids and, and so on, but that there are boundaries and, and so on. Um, it does kind of translate into behavior, particularly, well, in several ways. One is when parents believe that they have more legitimacy, too much legitimacy um, over personal issues, they tend to be psychologically controlling. Um, which we know is negative for adolescent adjustment, leads to greater norm breaking and depression. Um, we've also looked at family decision making and how decision making is, is handled within families. And we know that analogous to the judgments of legitimacy that I talked about, um, that the form of family decision making varies by the type of issues. So there are normative changes with age and by domain in how families tend to make decisions about these issues. And deviations um, from those patterns tend to be associated with maladjustment. So there's this, you know, I, I do give some, do some parenting workshops. And the take home message is really hard because there isn't one simple message. It's sort of like you need to be age and domain appropriate. You know, authority is legitimate and spoke some kinds of issues, not over others. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, complicated um, dance between giving your kid more autonomy and, and sort of holding the reins and letting go over different kinds of issues. Um, a colleague of mine in one of her publications talked about precision parenting, and I really like that term because I, I do think it takes a lot of sensitivity to sort of adolescence developmental needs and how they're shifting um, while still, you know, retaining authority and regulating certain kinds of issues in certain kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, I work in the school district that is a high rate of poverty. Um, and I'm, we're looking at the parental relationships and that correlation with behaviors we see. Now, um, your body of work, is there anything you would guide me toward that would focus more on the impact of so the role social economic component and those relationships? Yeah, I mean, there's quite a bit of research on that um, in terms of the higher rates of harsh parenting, punitive parenting, and its negative consequences. There's some debate in the literature about the need to strictly regulate kids' behavior because the environment is dangerous. Um, we found that in our African-American sample, even though they were middle class, they're still black. And, you know, there's a book, Driving While Black. So, you know, having, um, having adequate resources doesn't protect children. We're certainly seeing that now uh, in the news, that having adequate resources doesn't protect particularly black males from prejudice and racism and all the threats that that, that may involve. So um, it's a tough balance between not giving adolescents too much autonomy, you know, the appropriate amount of autonomy. But we do know that punitive and harsh parenting is destructive. So I don't know if that answered it well enough. I'm just wondering if, you know, you've talked about some of the studies you've done that if any of the works that you have or things that we would have access to <coughs> might be geared more to looking at that population. So in my own research, um, I have some research on Latino youth who are primarily poor, um, but we weren't looking at socioeconomic issues as much. 
And the closest is, is a really different context. So, um, you know, our refugee families are, <laughs> are really poor. And uh, dealing with all the adversities you can imagine, you know, terrible neighborhoods and stuff like that. But most of my research has not been um, in situations of adversity. There's plenty, of, there's some good research out there, so, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I had a question about the disclosure piece, which is really interesting to me. I'm talking from sociology, so my apologies if this reflects in the ignorance. But I was wondering if there was a way, and this is slightly uh, removed from your, fo your focus on the parent adolescent relationship, but if there's a way to get at whether there's a crowding out of support or expertise because of their engagement with school and other contexts. So maybe some of the non disclosure could be because they're engaging on certain topics with other people besides their parents? Is there a way to look at that in your Well, yes. I mean, we actually have a paper where we looked at uh, disclosure to peers versus parents. But I think on the issues that um, parents want to know the most and that are riskiest, it's probably it's not necessarily a good thing. Right. No, I'm not thinking of any statement about <laughs> yeah. where that, it's more just about where that conversation is happening. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I, we know that um, adolescents, that peers are considered authorities for lots of kinds of issues, but it's more the sort of issues that are less, you know, values related, risky behavior related. They may be authorities, but they're not good ones. Yeah. Thank you for a very really interesting talk. Um, I come from communication technology perspective, so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about disclosure, and disclosure, parental awareness, parental monitoring trends and patterns um, in terms of how technology and social media can change all of that. Because you know, if you think about social media, some information can become apparent and visible to parents, right? Just by virtue of them being in the same social network with the adolescents. So I was right. wondering if you have thought about that. I thought about it a little bit. I think it's really complex and it's totally fascinating. And it's something I'd really like to get to. I mean, part of, part of what's really fascinating about it to me is that things that adolescents consider to be private and personal, they're putting out there on social media, um, but still may not want their parents to know. And. Um, so I, you know, I don't have good answers to that, but I think it's a fascinating question. Maybe one more question, because I know some people have to go to one o'clock classes and so forth. So let's take one more, okay? And then if Pete, I'm sure people want to hang around and talk with Judy individually, I'm sure she's going to do that. Sure. But why don't you? I was curious about, uh, you've heard a lot in the media lately um, about helicopter care. Uh -huh. the tendency for parents to have expectations and basically do all the work for the kids and hover in that way and then try to control them, you know, either themselves or the illusion of control in that way. Over the course of your research career, have you been able to notice a pattern in the prevalence of helicopter parenting and is it you know, more prevalent in certain groups that you study? Yeah, I mean, helicopter parenting is a, is a popular term. There, there hasn't been, the research on it is slim. And um, I think is, at this point, conceptually, not, it's not well defined. Right. So I think we need more research that's more careful about the areas that, where parents are helicopter. First of all, I mean, most of the research in helicopter parenting looks at college students, right. not across adolescents. So, we don't exactly know what helicopter parenting is among younger adolescents. Um, and then actually in my lab, we've looked kind of closely at the research, and I think there's a lot of confusion, conceptual co confusion about, you know, is it enmeshment, psychological controls, or what's the, you know, exactly what is it involved? So I think it's something that needs to be clarified. Because this is a, you know, this is a high achieving community here in, in Ithaca, and there's there's a fair amount of that. <laughs> Even yes. at a young age, I know uh, one of my daughter's peers, her parents were grooming when those kids from elementary school to do the right activities. And, you know, it's a yeah. big five path, and I'm just wondering if you have 
I'm not sure that's, I mean, that's not exactly helicopter. People have also talked about over-involvement. I'm not sure that's exactly helicopter parenting, but I know exactly what you mean. And I do think we need, at least at a research level, um, much more precise definitions of what, you know, what qualifies someone as a helicopter parent. It's important. Well, thank you, Judy. And like I said, please stay around. It looks like the food is set up for lunch. And, uh, Thank you so much.